It's all about indeterminacy. The method of superposition is really big in later classes for civil engineers at least. The whole objective is we're given a situation that we can't solve with just statics. So you have three different forces here. Statics can't give me all three. It could give me a relationship of two of them in respect to the third. But as you can see here, if they use some engineering principles to get our by and then we'll be able to get ay and ma. So here's my general thought process as far as superposition. I like to split it up into different pictures and then the formulas just follow the pictures. It makes it a lot easier. What do I mean by two different pictures? Well it, it really depends on your preference. I particularly think that cantilever beams are easy so I try to turn everything into a cantilever beam as much as possible. Which means I'd want to get rid of my by support and just turn it into a regular force. The whole, the whole idea behind superposition is that this distributed load is pushing the beam down and this by would be pushing everything up and that if I add how much it's pushed down and how much pushed up at this particular point where the pin is, the actual displacement is zero. So in equation form, I would write that the deflection for one loading, this would be, I'll call my distributed load my first loading at A, plus my deflection at my second deflection at A equals zero, because it actually is not moving. So let's see, I have my first cantilever beam with just my distributed load. And that's going to end up looking something like this for deflected shape. So this is the deflection that we're calling V1 at A. This is our second loading, or our second deflection curve, and it is just some random, we don't know what BY is yet, but it is some random force that is replacing our pin and is pushing our beam up. So it's going to be curving and then it will go straight. But all we care about is the deflection right at this point. And I'm going to draw a third picture, which is going to be what we want everything to look like. Is it's going to look something like, I'm going to guess, it'll end up looking like that. I know that the deflection here is going to be zero. And I know the slope's going to be zero right there. And I'm really just guessing at the rest of it. It's based on intuition, but we can actually calculate it by the sum of these two pictures. We can actually look in the back of the book for the deflections at certain points, at any point x, on both of these beams. These are both situations that are found in the book. So I'll just copy down what the book says. It has a P, A, B, and Q. So this is V of x equals negative p x squared divided by 6 e i 3 a minus x and that applies from 0 to a but since we're doing it at a that's totally fine it's, we're cool we have negative q x squared 24 e i 6 l squared minus 4 l x plus x squared. And that applies to the whole entire beam. So since I want to know my v1 of a and v2 of a, remember that's not shear, that's a common misconception. This is deflection that we're adding together. So my total deflection at a, which equals 0, equals the sum of these two equations. Negative px squared 6ei 3a minus x plus a negative qx squared 24ei 6l squared minus 4lx plus x squared. So for p I'm going to plug in a negative by and that's because p was defined as positive downward and our by is, is up so that's going to be a negative uh, I'm replacing it with. Our x is going to be at a. Remember that we're trying to solve for what by is so that statics can tell us what the other two are. 0 equals negative 
negative by a squared over 6ei. 3a minus a plus a negative qa squared 24ei. 6l squared minus 4la plus a squared. I could put this term on the other side of the equation. So I have by a squared 6ei 2a equals qa squared over 24ei 6l squared minus 4al plus a squared. I can cancel out these ei's and this a squared and that will leave us with 6 over 2a q over 24 6l squared minus 4al plus a squared. And lastly, okay, so keep in mind, q is our distributed load, and I forgot to write it on this one, but it was 3 kilonewton per meter. Write that over here. 3 kilonewton per meter. a is the distance between left end and our load, which was 6 meters. l is the total span, which is 8 meters. 3 kilonewton per meter, 6 meters, 6 times our length squared, minus 4, 6 meters, 8 meters, plus 6 meters squared. So usually at this point I will take a look at our units to make sure that it is going to in fact come out to the units of a force, otherwise I've made a grave error and must be punished. So we got kilonewtons over meters over meters again, so that's uh, kilopascals actually, but kilo, kilonewton over meters squared times, these are all meters squared, which will just result in kilonewtons, which is the units of force. So good on me. I do not receive a punishment. 14.25 kilonewtons is our force for by. Look, we haven't even had to do any statics yet. That isn't my final answer, but this is the key so I can get the rest of my forces up here. So basic statics will tell me some of the forces in the y direction. I have my upward 14.25 kilonewtons, that's by. And I have my distributed load, which is minus three kilonewton per meter times the length that that distributed load is distributed. So that's eight meters plus my a y equals zero. So my a y ends up being 9.75 kilonewtons, which if you can imagine, since my support B is closer to the center, it makes sense that it would be taking more of the force. So 14 is bigger than nine, it kind of makes sense. Now some of the forces, at, or some of the moments at A, so I can find M A plus my by times the moment arm of a, which was six meters. And then I have to subtract the moment from my distributed load. So that's multiplied by the area it's applied, and then it's moment arm. And I have my moment arm is half the length, and that tells me that ma equals 10.5 kilonewton meters. And that's it. We solved an indeterminate beam.